the, the maneuvers for uh, Facebook and Twitter, and we will start in 30 seconds. Okay, hello everybody. Um, my name is Alexandre Michy. I'm a cardiologist working uh, at Molusson Hospital in France. I'm the chair of the telecardiology working group from the ISFTH. And I have the huge pleasure today to moderate um, a, an exceptional webinar named from uh, the Mercury Sphingo Manimeter to the smartphone, blood pressure measurement in the digital era. Uh, I will pass the word uh, right now to Professor Stefano Omboni, uh, who is the section chair on hypertension uh, of our working group. Hello, Stefano, how are you? Fine, thank you. Uh, I am uh, Professor Stefano Omboni. I am director of the Italian Institute of Telemedicine and professor of cardiology at the second of first Moscow State Medical University. And uh, I have the pleasure of being joined by two distinguished speakers this evening, Professor Alta Skutte from the University of New South Wales and the George Institute for Global Health in Sydney, Australia. She is immediate past president of the International Society of Hypertension. The other speaker is Professor Raj Padwell from the University of Alberta Hypertension and Dyslipidemia Clinic and he is past chair of the Hypertension Canada Clinical Practice Guidelines. We have also two uh, eminent discussants, Professor Beverly Green from the University of Washington and Professor Richard McManus from the University of Oxford. This webinar uh, aims to discuss the existing uh, blood pressure measurement methodologies that are the fundamentals for hypertension diagnosis and management and uh, it will highlight the relevant role of digital health in improving blood pressure measurement. I remind you that this section is interactive and we strongly encourage you to actively participate by sending your questions and comments at any time during the webinar through the chat. For the best learning experience, we also invite you to participate in online assessment sessions in the form of multiple choice poll questions which will be submitted at the beginning and at the end of each presentation. A general discussion will be done at the end of the two presentations. But now let's start. I will now hand it over to Professor Scutte and enjoy the webinar. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much, Stefano and uh, Alex. Uh, it's a great honor for me to also be uh, uh, part of this uh, excellent series of webinars um, and I'm very uh, excited to speak on this topic myself. It's something that I'm really passionate about. So I think I'll start off with a, a question to the audience, which should appear now. And um, I think it would be ideal for you all who attend this to complete this questionnaire at the beginning of my presentation. And then also I will repeat the same question at the end of my presentation. And it would be really interesting to see uh, whether you choose the same options. So the, the question is, what do you think about the future of cuffless, wrist-worn, blood pressure wearable devices over the next 10 years? So this is the small devices that look like a watch or that we see often these days uh, being worn. And uh, is it only, do you think it will be used for personal use only, only for research use, uh, that it will replace cuff-based ambulatory blood pressure monitoring? or that it be a tool for clinical practice to do continuous 24 hour um, blood pressure monitoring. So uh, please submit your responses and then uh, the answers will appear in a 30 seconds or so. So you have some time to complete this. And uh, once we get the response to the poll, I will uh, start with my presentation. So Alta, you right. should have the results. Yes, excellent, thank you, Alex. So interesting to see that um, many of you, almost 60% actually think it will be a tool, clinical practice tool to do continuous 24 hour home blood pressure monitoring. 
very interesting as it's actually not being used at all at the moment. So that would be uh, interesting to see how things turn out over 10 years. So uh, with that, I will now, um, let me just share my screen. Right. Um, so let's kick off then. Uh, so I will be speaking on the blood pressure measurement techniques and their clinical relevance. I think important to start off with the fact that blood pressure has a very variable nature. And in this simple slide, you can see continuous blood pressure being measured over 50 seconds. Uh, and you can see clearly that it's not staying the same. Uh, if you were, were to take a blood pressure measurement at 10 seconds, it would be quite different when than when you take it uh, 30 seconds later. And that is just normal. And I think um, some sort of a way of thinking about blood pressure that we don't often do, we think of it as a, as a static measure when we also look at guideline cutoffs, etc. So today uh, we are still using a very similar technique than, uh, that was discovered more than 100 years ago by Dr. Riva Rocky uh, in terms of the mercury sigma manometer. It's not encouraged to still use it today, but it's very much the case in, in many, many parts of the world. Um, and today the technique that we use are based on the same principle. Uh, in, in many, many instances, aneroid or mercury manometers are still being used. But of course, more and more, we are encouraging the use of uh, upper arm electronic devices, oscillometric met methods, and a very strong encouragement that these devices be validated for accuracy, as there are many devices going around that's not validated for accuracy and often may over or underestimate blood pressure. In uh, clinical practice guidelines, uh, and there are many, uh, for example, last year we released the 2020 International Society of Hypertension practice guidelines are very clear instructions on how to take blood pressure in, in the office. Uh, also this year in 2021, the European Society of Hypertension practice guidelines for office and out of office blood pressures have a very clear instructions to do so. You may be very familiar with these sort of images suggesting that or recommending for, for clinic or office blood pressures to be taken three times with one minute intervals and to use the average of the last two measurements. Because of the different devices that's currently available and especially the, the lower quality models that's not validated for accuracy, the World Health Organization released last year a, a technical report on uh, specifications for automated non-invasive blood pressure measurement devices. So I was also involved with this initiative and we included in, in this uh, document some uh, indication of all the different types of blood pressures you may be familiar with. I will not be speaking about the invasive methods here in red, but in terms of the non-invasive, we all are familiar with the mercury and then aneroid, as well as then the, on the automatic side, you've got the semi-automated automated device with cuff, and then the automated with cuff, which is really the device recommended also by the WHO, saying only accuracy validated automated blood pressure measurement devices recommended for clinical use. But on the other end of the spectrum in purple here is also uh, the cuffless techniques, linking with a mobile application, but it's not recommended and not suitable for clinical use because of lack of universal standards for validating the accuracy of blood pressure measurements. It's also in the latest clinical practice guidelines from European Society of Hypertension advised not to use cuffless, uh, cuffless devices uh, for this reason. There's not enough evidence in terms of accuracy. So in terms of the blood pressure uh, upper arm devices and, and several others, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there are websites such as the Stride BP website, uh, stridebp.org, which is really a, a authority of blood pressure monitoring devices where one can easily determine whether a device is uh, validated for accuracy. So let's get back to this variable nature of blood pressure because blood pressure is really not a, a static um, measure. 
it's uh, important to not only look at office blood pressures that's taken in the clinic or the doctor's office or in hospital, but to really take into account a patient's blood pressure when they're at home, when they're at sleep, work, uh, or exercising or, or doing anything normal out of the doctor's office, because we do know that, of course, there's the white coat effect and several other uh, anxiety-related issues that may affect blood pressure there. So in terms of out-of-office blood pressure, traditionally, we are all used to taking uh, ambulatory 24-hour blood pressure monitoring, as well as home blood pressure monitoring. And these are all strong being recommended in guidelines. Uh, importantly, they are recommended for uh, confirming diagnosis. So when you have taken office blood pressure measurement and it is uh, elevated higher than 130 over 85, it is recommended to confirm this with home or ambulatory. And that is for the reasons that I've mentioned. So if a patient has high blood pressure in the office due to anxiety or other reasons, then it's, it's strongly uh, encouraged to, to confirm this or when it's elevated, it may also be um, uh, a person may be at risk for mask hypertension. And we'll get to that in a second. In terms of ambulatory blood pressures, of course, uh, this is the sort of device that we are talking about. Patient has to wear it for 24 hours. They have to sleep with it. And um, of course, wearing this device and uh, with every 15, 15 minutes or so taking a measurement, it's not always that comfortable for patients. Uh, it may actually also cause a bit of anxiety or poor sleep in some, which is sometimes not that ideal but we know that we get extremely valuable measurements out of that to really see the profile over 24 hours, as you can typically see in this slide where you can really see during the night time uh, that there's a dipping and also to uh, look at other profiles. The availability of blood pressures over night time is of course also very valuable to identify all different sorts of uh, trajectories of blood pressure where some people's blood pressure do not dip sufficiently during the night time, which may place them at significant risk for cardiovascular events, or you can see an exaggerated morning surge. Uh, so this is ideal to really detect this, which is simply not possible by only taking a blood pressure measurement in the hospital or clinic. In terms of home blood pressure monitoring, uh, there we often see these sort of leaflets and instructions for patients, and uh, there are many available that's really good that indicate to them exactly how that measurement is to be taken. So we know that even in uh, the hospitals and clinics, it's not being taken correctly, which is one of the major challenges we face, and therefore a patient training in how to do home blood pressure monitoring correctly is extremely important. They should, for example, make sure that they rest before taking the blood pressure just to ensure the variability is as low as possible and sit still and do not speak. And, and often that is something that patients are not clear or aware of that they should do. And then they're recommended to take two blood pressure measurements in the morning and two at night uh, on a regular basis. So, uh, in terms of these measurements, they are ideal then to identify mass hypertension and white coat hypertension. So, of course, white coat hypertension is when you have high office blood pressure, but when you do out of office blood pressure, the blood pressure is normal, and we know that is a condition associated with increased risk, but not as much as sustained hypertension. And in the case of mass hypertension, it's a strange situation of having normal office blood pressures, but the, the individual's blood pressures is elevated when they take home or ambulatory blood pressures. And that is something that's often not detected. But these conditions are very real and very common. Um, a white coat hypertension occurring about 15 to 25% of patients and mass hypertension 10 to 20%. So it is something that's in every one in four or one in five patients. So that's is pretty common. And it's also, I will not go into detail with all the advantages and disadvantages. It's, some of them are very self-explanatory, but ambulatory devices are expensive and, and sometimes not available everywhere and can be uncomfortable, as I've mentioned before. Home blood pressures, on the other hand, is also, again, another static variable. Uh, uh, but it's at least available in morning and in the evening when the uh, patients should take their blood pressures. And there is the issue of potential measurement error and no readings during nighttime. 
but they have many other benefits. As I said, identifying white coat and mast hypertension, uh, this is cheap and widely available. And the patient often known setting is much more relaxed than in the office, of course. So each of these sort of measurements have clinical utility. Uh, if, you, if you look at this, for example, so office blood pressures are ideal, with three pluses here indicated ideal for screening. So that's where we easily detect when somebody has high blood pressure, it's ideal there. And it can be used for initial diagnosis and treatment titration, but not ideal and for follow-up. When we look at home blood pressures, uh, it's more ideal for following up the patient over long-term uh, periods to see whether their blood pressure is indeed controlled with treatment, uh, but also good for initial diagnosis and treatment titration. 24-hour blood pressure is, of course, not being uh, available or used for screening, but it's perfect for ideal uh, initial uh, diagnosis, the preferred method for diagnosis, actually. And then in pharmacy and public spaces, uh, these sort of blood pressures are ideal, mostly for screening purposes. So when we look at uh, these sort of blood pressures, one wonders what, what real picture do a clinician get? of the patient's actual blood pressure using these different techniques. So when you have office blood pressure and you take it for, for six months, um, you get a, three measurements at the beginning and three at the end, about six months, for example. So you get a, a, a sort of an idea what happens over this period of time. When we look at ambulatory blood pressures, you get a daytime great profile and nighttime excellent profile. And again, after six months, you can see where this all 24-hour profile have changed and improved. Uh, on the other hand, you don't know what's happening in between. Home blood pressures give you that picture where you have two measures in the morning and two at night uh, for, each, for each day. For a long period of time, it also gets the patient self-engaged, hopefully with their blood pressures. And after six months, uh, you can really get a good profile of that. But of course, and this is actually just uh, on the very other, other end of that spectrum, is you get some patients that get phobia beyond white coat uh, effects. So uh, this is actually the point, not the point that I want to make. It just indicates that some, some patients, uh, and I think most patients actually do experience some form of um, increased pressure during the cuff measurement process. So even during nighttime pressures or just taking it at home, there is a, a slight form of anxiety when you know that a blood pressure measurement is being taken. Of course, some patients are really um, reacting adversely to this whole situation, which may have a problem in terms of treatment afterwards. But the ideal would be to take blood pressure without a patient being aware of it. And, and that is the way and the direction we would actually like to go. And at the moment, we are inundated with uh, wearable cuffless devices. There are many on the web when you start searching. Um, and there's actually been a search down here in Australia looking for the number of non-validated home blood pressure devices. And it's clear that they are, are dominating the online marketplace. Uh, we were able to find 532 different sorts of wristband wearables, but none of these were validated for accuracy. And that is at the moment our main challenge, that these devices are not validated and therefore cannot really be recommended for clinical use. Um, but however, this year, earlier this year, this, this one specific device, and I'm, I'm sure it's just the first of many, have been validated for accuracy based on the sitting blood pressure, so the traditional protocol to my understanding. And uh, this device has been shown to indeed be accurate and thus useful. So it's a basically a very small device on the arm connected by Bluetooth to the phone and give you your blood pressure profile uh, over long periods of time. So for example, over this week, one week period, a total of 340 two blood pressures were taken um, in this individual over day and night. So you can see the profile, it's a large number of blood pressures. And if you look at that profile over uh, a month for one individual, you, and there you can clearly see the variability when you plot daily blood pressures on top of each other for one month, you can really see 
a very, very detailed profile without the patient even being aware that the blood pressure is being taken. So in this case, in one month, 2,551 measurements were taken. And of course, that could, if this is uh, accurate, this could, could become a very powerful tool to detect whether blood pressure control is reached, especially in those with raised blood pressure. And there's other potential usefulness, I think, which we need to, to take into account. Uh, for example, determining the time that, a, uh, that the patient is at target blood pressure, which we know is really uh, becoming an important measurement too. So when you look at uh, cuffless measurements, uh, it's really a very detailed profile over a long period of time uh, and, and can really give you an indication of true blood pressure control. So uh, I'll end off here. And my take-home messages are basically that, and I hope you got that one, that blood pressure is variable from second to second. And we never should forget that. And that in most clinics and hospital office, blood pressure is really still the cornerstone of diagnosis and management using the same principal techniques as more than 100 years ago. And of course, there are obvious benefits. These devices are available uh, everywhere. Uh, they are not expensive in general, and it's easy to do although the technique is often not done correctly when taking blood pressures. In terms of out-of-office blood pressures, this is uh, much more versatile. It gives you much more depth in terms of whether uh, the pro what the profile of the patient looks like. It describes the true blood pressure but also during nighttime and overtime and guiding in the identification of white coat and mass hypertension. And then uh, to end off with, thousands of wearable devices becoming available at the moment, it is a difficult situation because um, many are not, or all, almost all, are not uh, validated for accuracy. But I'm sure this situation will change, and I think we need to be ready for that moment when this um, may change the course of how we do blood pressure measurements in, in clinical practice. And so we need to find ways to integrate this technology to improve patient management and engagement in monitoring their own blood pressure. Thank you. I think I will uh, end here. And uh, if uh, I can ask Alex to again display the same question that I started off with, um, it would be interesting to see whether we see the same uh, profile by the audience. Thank you so much, Alta. So I'm not sure. Uh, okay, can you see the image, or can you see the? the, the uh, no. Yeah, do you no. mean the second question? No, this the same question that I started off. Uh, just to show that one again, is it if that is possible? Um, yeah, I see it on my screen, but I think that the audience will okay don't have access to it. Sorry. No, that's, that's all good. Thank you. So thank you, Alta, for your excellent and very clear presentation. Uh, I will end uh, uh, the, um, I, I will end it over to uh, Professor Padua. Uh, he will uh, enter into much detail in telemedicine and the role of mobile health for improved blood pressure assessment and control. Please, Raj. All right, great. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Amboni. Uh, and it's a, it's a real honor to be in this group and to be presenting uh, for this webinar. Um, so Alex, I guess, are you able to put up the poll question that I had formulated? Yes, of course. So while Alex is doing that, I will share my screen. So it's all it's all it's live. The question is live, open for voting. Excellent, thank you. So this question I formulated with will digital health solutions for monitoring and treatment be integrated into routine hypertension care? And I'd like you to answer, if you haven't already, uh, from the perspective of your region, uh, not what you might predict may happen somewhere else across the world. Absolutely, they already are integrated. Uh, yes, within the next two years, 
within the next 10 years and or or uh, I think it's over 10 years away if it ever happens. So if you're quite cynical about it, that would be your answer. Um, so we will wait the 30 seconds. And in the meantime, I will just put my disclosures up. Uh, here's uh, my most recent funding. I think the most pertinent disclosure for this uh, webinar is that I actually also am CEO of a university-based uh, spin-out, and that's called Millimeters Mercury. And I am going to spe be speaking a little bit about Millimeters Mercury uh, coming up in a few slides, but the remainder of the talk is more general. So here are the poll results. Yes, within the next two years. Wow, 54%. I never expected that. I thought it would be more yes within the next 10 years. So I don't seem to have to convert the majority of the audience, but let's see how this goes. Um, and I, I also want to say for those of you that are academics, we flipped our, uh, almost our entire um, innovation portfolio, if you will, over to commercialization. There's a dearth of academics in commercialization work. And I would highly encourage you to consider getting involved in this kind of work because we need academics in it in order to create products that are the most useful for users and patients. Here are my objectives and they're quite simple, uh, 15 minutes. Uh, I really want to give you an overview of what I feel is happening in M Health is the topic assigned, but in fact, I would submit to you that the proper term is probably digital health for what I'm going to be speaking on and uh, focusing primarily on hypertension care. And then also giving my thoughts on what I see as the future state in this area. So to start off with uh, definitions here, um, we have, uh, I like this slide because it gives an outline of the an entire course of these terms. And these terms tend to be interchanged, which um, is a limiting factor sometimes. Uh, telemedicine is a term used for a patient provider interaction, uh, whereas telehealth is more used for a broader uh, type of term for um, teaching and also healthcare administrative purposes. Uh, E-health was a term that was um, coined in the 1990s and focused more on internet type work. And I think that term has broadened out more to digital health now. M-health is a term that we use more for wireless and mobile health. And I think that's an important term as well. But the more catch-all term now, I think, is digital health. And digital health also encompasses predictive analytics, AI, ML, et cetera. Now, we've all gone through this unfortunate scenario of COVID, which is still ongoing across the world, unfortunately. Um, but one of the silver, silver linings of COVID um, is this transformation of use of digital information. And I think when you look at this transformation, um, what this quote says is I think true for healthcare. Uh, Satya Nadella is the CEO of Microsoft. He's not in fact um, health focused per se. Although I will point out that Microsoft, one of the biggest companies in the world only started their cloud in 2011. So 2010, sorry, 11 years ago. And think of the massive growth that's happened in technology in general with the cloud. And he says what he's thinking of doing in 2030 is going to be possible in 2025. And I think that by, same, by similar analogy, this is what we're going to see in healthcare. My second and last analogy before I turn to clinical issues and health issues is FinTech. So. I don't know how many of you follow the fintech space, um, but I mean, growing up in Canada, the way we access banks was to slog over to the bank, wait in line between these velvet ropes until you got your turn. 
and then talk to the teller and get the banking done. And that by analogy is very similar to how we do clinical medicine, where we ask a patient to travel, sometimes in my province for six, seven hours to come and see me for a 10 minute visit. And so what has happened in FinTech is first there was cloud adoption, and then there was sort of peer to peer small business type payments launched. And then in 2015, we've now had mobile take over laptops in terms of how many people bank on which platform. And then I will submit to you, the peer to peer part of FinTech is gonna grow massively enabled by crypto and by the blockchain. And I think we see those same trends happening in healthcare. It'll take some time, but the shift to cloud, the shift to mobile is here. And then these other developments later, I think like blockchain, maybe tokenization, these will come. Now I created this slide to show you what I think are the primary um, concepts, I guess, or developments, if you will, uh, in the field um, and have color coded them. So, so first let's start off with green. So digital health solutions that are green, cloud-based blood pressure telemonitoring. So this is being used in a lot of places now, especially in the US. Um, the US is kind of always on the vanguard because the commercially insured portion of the US market, the US market's an uneasy alliance of several different um, types of uh, um, healthcare delivery uh, markets, I suppose. Um, but it's being used now and it's being pushed forward. And I'll show you why in a minute. Um, I think telemonitoring should really be uh, offered always with case management, especially targeted to those high risk individuals. And then of course, the great work that uh, Dr. McManus and his colleagues have done on uh, patient uh, used protocols and self titration, I think that's ready for prime time as well. And we should use it. Uh, digital registries, I'm gonna give you some examples in a minute. Now I've coded emerging technologies here as AMBER. AIML is something that's being used in health right now. Um, maybe not as much as it could be used for hypertension, but an example would be use of chatbots to triage patients uh, who think they may have COVID. So you can use these chatbots triage to uh, stay at home, get a test, uh, go to clinic, go to eMERGE. And I think this kind of an opportunity exists in a, a broad swath of, um, of health, including cardiovascular risk uh, reduction purposes. Digital therapeutics, um, I'm gonna talk about it loosely in a few slides and then specifically. So we'll wait and talk about it. The wearables, Alta already covered. You can see how I answered your poll question, uh, Alta. Um, see, I just think, you know, with the issue of the need for calibration, well, then you have to have the user buy two devices. They need a home device and they need a wearable. And then there's the need, for, there's the problem with drift, which has never been really solved that I know of, and motion, and then validation, as Alta pointed out, and on so on. Not that... I don't think it will have a place, but um, it's not ready in my opinion. This is the problem we're all solving. I won't belabor or trying to solve. Um, I won't belabor this, but in most countries in the world, I will submit to you that control rates will plummet uh, during COVID and after COVID because of the lack of um, attention given to cardiovascular risk reduction. And it's really unfortunate um, and really unacceptable that only one in seven individuals globally uh, has hypertension under control. Um, and so we have to do better. We have to innovate and do better. Um, so many of you out there listening are probably quite familiar with the Kaiser model. So Kaiser is the large, uh, largest managed uh, uh, care organization in, in the US. Uh, and around 2000 and continuing until now, they've been able to raise their blood pressure control rates to about 90%. And maybe you could quibble about how that control is defined, but nevertheless, 
with these five key elements, they were able to do this. And two of the elements involve digital type of components. Number one, a hypertension registry. And number two, the ability to perform audit and feedback. And so then the treatment-based algorithms, the case management and the simplified single pill combination and access to medications all play off of the digital foundation. And this has been enshrined in the CDC HEARTS program, WHO HEARTS program. Two of the six pillars, as you can see on the left, are access to technology and systems for monitoring. So digital health is front and center, I think, in improving blood pressure control going forward. And in America, pushed partly by the American Medical Association and Michael Raycott's, Dr. Michael Raycott's, who's heading that hypertension initiative, who is a, just a fantastic and very visionary leader, um, they're pushing forward with reimbursement. So there's the R word, reimbursement is needed if you're going to remake the way care is happening across the world and it's happening in the US. There's two sets of codes, one a broader RPM code strategy uh, and then dedicated hypertension codes. Uh, the second key driver of what's happening in the US is interoperability is being hugely emphasized. And so you have companies like small companies like ours, big companies creating all kinds of solutions. Some people focused on adherence, some people focused on monitoring, some people focused on delivering medications, and those need to talk to each other seamlessly. And I think we will get to that state eventually. Um, network access is a huge issue, um, but of course, you know, in, in developed countries, not, not as much as in developing, but still everyone in the world needs access. And that, that continues to be a big focus and a, and a mandated uh, prerequisite. And then team-based care. Uh, uh, and I think part of team-based care can be done in an automated AI ML fashion over time. Here's a great example of a very elegant digital registry. So this is from Resolve to Save Lives. It's aptly named the simple app. And uh, really what this allowed Resolve to do is onboard one and a half million patients in India where the clinics are super busy and the providers have minutes per patient to spend before they must move on. So with this QR coding and this uh, simple application, one can onboard a patient in 60 seconds, follow their blood pressures over time, and recall them for follow-up visits. Another concept I mentioned earlier is case management. This was a subject of, um, and BP tel monitoring, this was a subject that uh, Professor Ambani uh, went through um, uh, a few months ago, so I'm not gonna belabor. The, the, the size of the effect is about five millimeters. And so if that's the case, you really want to target to high-risk individuals, in my opinion, in order to achieve what's probably a cost-saving intervention if you keep your case management costs down. One of the things we have to understand is what are the components of a good solution when you talk about a tech solution, in this case, a home BP telemonitoring, um, you know, upper arm devices, as Alta mentioned, very important, decades of, uh, of research on it. Uh, um, Bluetooth enabled in America, big push towards only recognizing digitally transmitted readings to avoid um, misreporting. Uh, Smartphone-based systems, I think, are probably the best right now because smartphone penetration in developed countries is 80% and in developing or in the rest of the world or in the entire world, sorry, WHO puts it at almost 50% now. Uh, of course, you have to have secure storage and then a way for providers to, to look at the data and all of this has to be done in a proper regulatory framework. Um, now I'm just, I'm just gonna briefly get into millimeters mercury. So as I mentioned before, we are a um, academic group that have spun out a digital health company and really focused on keeping costs low, but clinic, infusing best clinical practice into our products. Um, and then we really are also focused on wide scalability. So I'll just give you an example of what we're doing um, in, in our two basic main platforms, which we're now building 
Uh, what I would say are the more innovative aspects of the platforms, but we built the foundational aspects and they're shown here. Um, so our first is a remote patient monitoring solution, like many of them out there, except maybe a couple differentiating features. So it's smartphone based, four languages, two platforms. Um, but we really try to make sure, for example, on the measurement page, as Alta went through, that a graphic of good measurement is shown. Um, on the clinician page, that they can do a rapid swipe average, tap and, and, and um, swipe on the screen in order to get the best understanding of the blood pressure and what's needed for titration of medications. Uh, we are device agnostic, but we also partner with a &D Medical as well, and that's known as the heart track system. We have over 35 different Bluetooth peripherals and a secure cloud and a lot of options for better management from the clinician side. Um, speaking of ambulatory, so Alta went through very nicely ambulatory. It's, it's as we all know, super underused, unfortunately. Um, you know, I really think you really shouldn't be doing a lot of diagnosis if you can't offer ambulatory. Uh, because the discordance rate between ambulatory and home is about 80%. And, you know, I mean, if you're going to make a diagnosis and for insurance and medication purposes, you really need to ensure it's the right one. So we've created a cloud-based ambulatory blood pressure monitoring platform, which we've just released. Um, it's a Bluetooth tablet based and has a digitalized diary so that the diary embeds in the, in the, graph that the clinician is interpreting with an auto interpretation, a quick digital signature, and both these platforms being used by researchers and clinicians. As you can tell, a research platform with ambulatory having all the readings is pretty powerful. You don't just have to go by the averages. And I'm almost finished here. I want to finish up with digital therapeutics because I think, you know, I would encourage us all to start thinking about, we certainly are, about how can we uh, formulate a digital therapeutic strategy for hypertension and risk reduction. It's being done, it's being done for mental health. Um, there are several FDA approved digital therapeutic strategies for sleep, for weight, but I think you know the time has come to think about hypertension. If we loosely define it as a, a solution that use one or more of these components on the left, blood pressure is reduced by about four millimeters. Again, I think you want to target to high risk individuals um, and trials with multiple behavioral interventions did better. As far as I know, this is very recently published from Japan, Dr. Cario's group. As far as I know, this is the only published uh, study of digital therapeutics and hypertension. Uh, this company who made this herb uh, digital therapeutics offering um, is called CureApp, and they started out in Japan. And really what this involves now, this is true digital therapeutics, where you ask a few questions at the beginning, get a sense of that personalized patient, and then offer a personalized strategy on, in this case, non-pharmacological uh, interventions um, to improve blood pressure. Unfortunately, it didn't work. But it's the first one, and I think we have to keep going and keep trying because I think if you look at other facets of health and medicine, um, it, it, it's a promising area. Uh, I would re be remiss not to mention challenges and barriers. The digital divide is a huge one where pa patients don't have access to um, digital technology, and that's got to change. And the second one I mentioned right off the top lack of expert driven solutions. That's why academics need to get involved in, in this space. Uh, and then my final slide, um, and just props to Stefano. This is such a great figure that he's come up with. And it also covers the Tholomius platform that, that he and his colleagues uh, are, are, um, are offering. And I, I think it's much more than hypertension that they're doing, but it, it's, I mean, it looks fantastic. Uh, but I love this figure because it's patient at the center, patient at the center with mobile uh, sort of revolving in a circle around them. And then you have all these different areas of um, information that hopefully we can make it so that the patient can direct and, and take, take a role, take a primary role in their health.
And so it doesn't matter where you're born. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter your access to healthcare. Uh, in the future, if you have a smartphone, you can basically have the same kind of care anywhere in the world. That's you know the future state that that we're we're looking towards. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, I think you know we are at the somewhat early innings, but not the first inning of um, pushing forward in digital health. Some solutions like self titration, blood pressure tail monitoring, case management should be offered now and are being in some aspects and some um, health systems. I think that there are much more um, innovative things coming and, um, and uh, I hope we can all continue to partner and uh, push things forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raj, for this very interesting and uh, updated presentation. I personally hope that uh, mobile health and telemedicine in general will be a very, very, very uh, widespread used uh, way to manage hypertensive patients. Uh, I will open the discussion. Uh, I have collected a few questions. We have uh, 15 minutes, so I invite uh, Professor Green first and Professor McManus if they have some questions for, for the speakers. So please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, thank you for that lovely talk and so uh, much hope for the future that we will see uh, digital uh, health and blood pressure monitoring um, become part of routine care. Um, I, I have found that some of the biggest barriers are, are patients and providers um, and their, uh, their understanding of blood pressure variability and their trust in machines versus humans. And uh, being convinced that, uh, that humans probably do the best job in measuring blood pressure, which isn't true, uh, that what we found in our studies. Um, how do we move people away from that and kind of move them towards just using automated blood pressure measurements in general and, and, and understanding both variability and accuracy and validation? Right. Um, <laughs> okay. I will. I will take this one. It's a. It's a very good question. I think it's important that um, uh, there should be a mind shift. That's what I. That's why I started off with blood pressure variability. I think overall there's uh, understanding that it's a static, uh, that a static uh, sort of measurement. It's how it's portrayed often in guidelines. You know, people may think that's the way, and um, therefore it's. I think really important to change that. And I think the current digital technologies that we see with other, other variables and, and tools that uh, individuals have with all these other um, heart rate monitors, et cetera, they can see that their heart rate is changing from second to second or from activity to activity. So hopefully there will be a change in that perception. But in terms of clinical management, I am, I'm not sure how this will, will take place. Um, it's been the same way for so many years. I think the excellent a presentation by Raj in terms of integrating all different sorts of technology. Uh, the world seems to be ready for it. And I, I really hope that that's taken up. Perhaps a short and brief for me. Yeah, and no, I will just add to your question very briefly, Bev. I think that how do we do it? We also have to ensure that accurate clinically validated monitors are out there because my colleagues in the, in the, um, other countries like Latin America, where we've done a fair bit of work, they, you know, Pedro Ordonez from PAHO is always talking about how the mistrust of automated devices, because the devices sourced in those countries are not validated. And patients see that and they see they're getting readings all over the place, can't be true. And then they want, a pro they want an auscultatory reading done to confirm. And, and so we got to get validated devices out. Okay, Richard, do you have a question? So yes, so thanks. So my, my question um, links quite nicely to what, what uh, Alta and Raj have just been saying. So we have these new devices coming on that Alta uh, was introducing uh, to us. Um, and in those, we, are, we have measures of variability that are mm -hmm. very different to the measures of variability that we've had. We, we have mean blood pressure, which means something very different and might be different from mi minute to minute it, now that you can measure it over, over a minute, um, let alone from morning 
to, to night time and so on. And then you have issues about sampling and how often should you sample and should you sample everything or just some of it and how do you decide what to do? So I think that there's obviously a lot of research questions there to, to get one going, but where, where should we start with, with, with this new mass of data? Where, what should we be thinking about? So perhaps if Alta could start and then Raj. Yes, I think uh, you're spot on, Richard. I think that the potential is huge. And that's where Raj also mentioned we need the academics to step in and see how can we best use also this sort of rich, rich data that will be produced and how should we interpret it in light of the traditional cuff-based measurement? How is it different? Um, I think there are... There are many potential uses in terms of first patient self-engagement to really, hopefully that will help with that. I, I, I really think it would be great if patients are more engaged with monitoring their own blood pressure. But I think artificial intelligence, machine learning sort of techniques to really, we should use all of the data in my opinion, if we can utilize it correctly. Of course, uh, producing this in a sort of an app or other electronic um, or pro, computer programming, to indicate just a specific measure such as time at target that the blood pressure is controlled would probably be one of the easy ways. We only see the easy interface on how it's being interpreted by artificial intelligence. And I know this is a long way to go, but I do think we have lots of this uh, available already. And it's just how to do it right now. And it will take time and it will take effort for many in the acad academic world to really get to that point. Yeah. So, so Raj, I I have GPs in the UK telling me they can't cope with 28 readings uh, if, uh, all at once. <laughs> so we're going to send them now, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands of readings. Is, is AI the way, uh, as Alta says, or is there another way of sorting this out? I think Alta nailed it. I mean, you know, you just think of, OK, we have the cloud, right? You need the cloud. You can't do this without a cloud. Um, then we have the AI ML capability. And I would have fully agree that these cuffless devices, the, where they'll shine is trending. They don't give you an absolute reading until, well, they do if you calibrate it. But if the calibration's off and the drift and all of that stuff, then you're just, I think where they really give you a lot of great data is in the trending. Um, now, what, how, will health, how will healthcare providers deal with it, Richard? This is why academics need to get into the, you know, they need to get involved because the whole thing gets derailed if it's not guided and there's not input from academics because it is you guys that, and gals that have the perspective over the last century of what happened with BP and BP measurement. And then I will just point to you, Richard, no one is, was really doing a lot of ABPM um, around in our province. And then when we released our platform, people became interested because it synthesizes the bottom line for them. And so when we talk about the question about what to do with providers and a thousand measurements, don't show them the thousand <laughs> measurements, <laughs> they, will, they, will, they will get irate. What you do is you synthesize the bottom line for them, but we have to learn what is the bottom line first. And so there's a lot of work to do. Okay, uh, there are some questions from the audience. I try to summarize and pick up two questions, one for Alta. Uh, they are asking if uh, uh, there is some reference ac accuracy for uh, cuffless, uh, cuffless uh, devices. Um, and another guy is uh, uh, questioning about the, the, the fact that there is not an ISO uh, protocol for uh, validation of uh, cuffless uh, devices. So if these uh, devices are uh, getting into practice, uh, should we trust them? Should we approach uh, uh, to um, validation with a, a different protocol? What do you think? Yes, that is the niggle at the moment. I think that's the, the biggest challenge. We need to create a different sort of way to do that. And I'm not sure why. I think that's that's what most people have been battling with. I think, Stefano, you would know even better also in terms of um, ambulatory blood pressure validation. It's the same problem. So we can do the validation while the patient is sitting and comparing it with another, another method that is accurate. So that remains one of the major challenges. But in my opinion, <laughs> uh, if you can validate it for a sitting blood pressure, 
then there should be potential. I mean, if you track it then over 24 hours with, with massive amounts of data, there would still be huge value in it, even if it's one millimeter of mercury the up or down. Um, I think it's, it's, it's still very rich. And if the more data we get, the more we will be able to, to deal with that correctly. But yes, ideally we need another ISO to do that. And with the massive amounts of devices coming up, we need to figure out something. <laughs> Um, yes. and, and, and I think that's the next step in order to move forward, to get trust. Mm. And the question for, for uh, Rush about uh, wearables. Uh, wearables are usually developed by engineers and informatics. So usually healthcare professionals uh, do not play um, uh, a proper role in developing these uh, 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 devices. And often uh, the patients are considering these uh, devices like sort of gadget, but they are still measuring their blood pressure and showing this pressure to the doctor, uh, like these pressures are uh, in some way uh, comparable to uh, what we are measuring with validated devices at all. What do you think about these two aspects? developing of wearables and the use of patients without any advice by, by, by doctors. They simply go and buy on the online or on the shop. What do you think? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, it's a tough question for me to answer because uh, it puts me in a rough spot. I wouldn't be much of a, a tech CEO if I, if I dissuaded my patients from using tech. Um, so... I would say I don't dissuade anyone from using it. I just ask alongside of that, they, they do things I request, like proper seven day, you know, in Canada, it's seven day home measurement. Some countries have less. Um, and then if I really want to know what's going on, a proper 24 hour. Um, and, and I haven't had many patients that disagree. And I guess if they disagree, they probably won't come back and see me anyway. So, uh, so I think, you know, allow people to explore, because I think what Alta says, there is going to be some future for these, it's going to be used in health, we just have to figure out how it fits. Um, so that that would be my approach. Thank you. I think uh, we are perfectly on time. Uh, I think, Alex, we can, uh, we can close the, this very interesting webinar. Thank you so and, much, Stefano. Yes, please. Please go ahead. Please, please go ahead. So uh, we are very happy to have uh, to add, uh, a, a very uh, important audience. So we had uh, 70 uh, people uh, following us. I thank you, uh, Professor Skutte, Professor Padwal, and of course, uh, yeah. Dr. Miskian, and Professor Green, and Professor McManus. I remember that uh, you can watch this webinar on demand on the Telecardiology Working Group uh, website. I thank you for joining us, and I remember that uh, we will organize a new webinar probably in September or October focusing on a very, very uh, interesting aspect related to telemedicine for hypertension management. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Stefano. Thank you, Raj. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you, Alta and Richard. Have a nice evening, and I hope you enjoy the webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.